we want to send out a prayer and thoughts for all of Hannah's family and friends who have suffered the brutal loss of their loved one. Today's story is taking us to beautiful South America, where this country is rich and full of awe and wonder. It has beautiful beach to enjoy. With its rich culture and friendly people, with the crime rates being high, we rarely hear of them because it does not come across the borders. This is why our case has taken us to Stellenbosch. This is a town. It's just east of Cape Town. It has hundreds of vineyards, and it's also known for its wine industry. The university town, too, as well. Needless to say, it's a wealthy place to live in. It does have shops, boutique cafes, art galleries that is beyond words to look at. This is the home of Cornelia's family, one in particular, and her name is Hannah. She was born to William and Anna on February the 13th, 1996, who they loved very dearly. William was a magistrate in the nearby town, and her mother was a practicing lawyer. Hannah was in a well-balanced home for sure, with all the proper upbringing. And then three years later, Hannah became a big sister, which she did not take lightly. She loved being a big sister and would love to help her brother with anything that he needed due to his learning battles with severe autism. Hannah would help him tackle it head on. She had a smile that would brighten anyone's bad day. She also had a gift to talents. She loved drama classes she was in school. Also, a teenager, she had played the piano. As Hannah started high school, she blossomed. She had many friends. By the time of graduation, she has excelled and had an average score of 85 plus percent. Even though Hannah was very popular, that many liked her, and there was one person that she cared about, and that was her high school sweetheart. And his name is Frenello, who Hannah had adored. They had went to the prom together, but her father, like many fathers, he did not want to see his little girl grow up and move on. Well, she had grown up to be a beautiful woman. She always had her home roots to count on. Hannah was now 21 years old. She was a very kind person, smart and always hardworking. She was a carbon copy of her parents together. She had signed up for the university and got a bachelor's degree in humanities. She wanted to learn more about the world and that what it had to offer, its history, everything around her, she wanted to explore it. Then two months had gone in. Her life was on track and she was ecstatic about it. In the summer of 2015, she had started her bachelor's degree at Stellenbosch University. She had taken with such passion. She loved her studies. She had lived nearby at the Irene Ladies residence. She also needed to go back and forth to the university. Her loving grandmother, who was 90 years old, had a car that she had no longer wanted or even used, and she gifted it and handed it to Hannah. It was a blue and white Volkswagen City Golf. Even though Hannah had a busy schedule with classes and doing her studying, she always managed to volunteer at the local animal sanctuary where she loved helping. She was a very compassionate person and cared for everything and everyone around her. While going to the university, she had made many friends. There were many friends that were just drawn to her with her personality, the charisma, the way she was easy to talk to and also be around. While she was making new friends, this is where she had met a certain man named Cheslin Marsh. She had met him in her second year. He was studying theology. Hannah and Cheslin had a lot in common. They both loved being a student and also worked hard. He was an easygoing person, just like she was. They had hit it off with a the connection they had. Hannah and Cheslin 
We studied together and learned from one another to help with the particular studies if they needed it. Hannah and Cheslin did not have a romantic feelings between them. They just were good best friends, and they loved hanging out and studying together. By 2017, both of them were midway in their second year at the university. On Friday, they had a long week. They'd been studying and working hard, so they decided to go out on a night to join some friends for some well-deserved drinks. All Hannah's friends had enjoyed themselves, including Hannah unwinding from the long week. Having some drinks was great for her and her friends. They had been playing dominoes. This was a very popular game in the South Africa among students. As they drank and played, the night had become to turn into early morning on Saturday, May 27th. As she had noticed the evening was coming to an end, she told them she was going to be calling it a night. However, Cheslin knows the streets and are not safe walking home, especially for pretty young girls like his friend Anna. He did not want her to go alone. So he grabbed his skateboard in hand and told her he was going to walk with her back to Irene Skull's residence, since he just lived close by from there. Hannah did take his offer with gratitude and appreciation. So they left her friends and headed home without no incidents or issues. Hannah now was worried about Cheslin getting home safe, so she had offered to drive him home. Her car was just around the corner. Chesna told her that he would be fine just riding his skateboard home, that, that he did not need her to drive him home. However, Hannah was persistent, and she did not take no for an answer. She knew driving a car would be faster, safer for him. Now, on CCTV at 3.23, Saturday, May 27th, Hannah had pulled into the small patch of grass, and this is where they would talk a bit and say the goodnights. As they were talking, neither one of them had noticed and did not see four men walking along the road right by them. Without warning, they had no idea that these men were going to be going around and circling back to the car. These men were out trying to find new victims, and they found them. It was Hannah and Cheslin. They were their new targets. secretly surrounded the car. They hit the car. Both Hannah and Cheslin knew that they were not safe any longer. The passenger door was ripped open by one of the men, and they had a sharpened screwdriver, also a flipped knife, and they held it against their chests. They had forced their way into the car. Now, this had became a real carjacking, with Hannah and Cheslin caught in the middle. One of the four men, named Julius, left the situation. He is not involved any longer of the night's events of what happened. He was the one that was to stalk and get a car, and his job was done, so he was no longer needed. Hannah had been shoved between Vernon Whitboy and Geraldo Parsons in the front seat, while Cheslin was in the back with a man named Eben Neilkirk. They were on CCTV. You can see Hannah's car leaving the area at 3.40 a.m. I can only imagine the fear that Hannah and Cheslin must have felt at that particular moment. Now, after the footage that was caught on CCTV, 
the car leaving the area, it would not be seen for over an hour. Then it was finally caught later on CCTV at 4.34 in the morning. It had went by a gas station just on the outskirts of Stellenbosch. Here you will see a figure of a cream-colored jacket in the passenger seat. As the men had drove around town on a dirt road, they had stopped the car and put Cheslin in the back trunk. But before they did that, they took everything that he had on him, even his coat and shoes. This night would get even worse for them both. It would be the night of horrors. Then a surveillance camera inside the gas station captures one of the carjackers named Vernon entering and going right over to the ATM. He was carrying a wallet, and this wallet was Cheslin's. He took the card and would try to withdraw the money out, and he used the pin that Cheslin had gave him. Vernon had tried many times to withdraw the money, but it did not work because Cheslin had told him the wrong pin number to use. This would be something he would be punished and regret at a later time in the night. As they drove, they headed to Cry Fountain. This is a neighboring town of Stellenbosch. Hannah, through this whole ordeal, she had remained calm and cooperative. She did everything they said for her to do. She did not look around, nor did she say anything. She just looked straight ahead at the road. As they went into the local area, the men had stopped in many places to visit and various people that they knew. They were dropping off and picking up drugs. Cheslin was still in the trunk during all of this, not knowing what was going on. When he did not hear them, he would kick the roof of the trunk, hoping that someone might hear or try to help him just hoping that maybe it might pop open. But no one came, nor did the trunk hood open. This is until 5.30 in the morning, when going to Cry Fountain, just outside, the men had stopped the car. Hannah then asked, why are they stopping? And they said they needed to have a smoke break. Little did she know what they were about to do. The two men had jumped out of the car and went to the trunk, and they opened it, to get Cheslin out of it. They were still mad that he did not give them the pin to get money out of his ATM account. Now he will pay with his life. They pushed and shoved him further into the woods, away from the car. The men told him to lay down on the ground. He complied. At this moment, Cheslin knew his time was up and they were going to kill him. As Cheslin was getting down on the ground, he had looked up, and the last thing he saw was the two men over him with bricks in their hands. Then it was over in a flash. They had hit him with the bricks. Then they had left after the brutal attack on Cheslin. Now the night time turned into morning. As the sun rose, the night of horrors was still in bloom, that they were not done. What they're about to do to Hannah was horrified, the cruelest form of violence done to anyone. As they drove on, it was not far from where Cheslin's body lay. This is where the unthinkable went down. Hannah had been sexually assaulted by all three of the men. After the assault on Hannah, they had drove in the vineyard. They had tried to take Hannah out of the car, and she kept saying no. She had grabbed the side of the car so they could not get her out. Deep down, she knew what they were going to be able to do to her, but they overpowered her and dragged her out of the car. As they did, they got a sharpened screwdriver, and within an instant, they stabbed her in the neck. Then one of the men had saw a nearby large boulder. He had picked it up and dropping the two-feet rock on her head, killing her instantly on impact. After killing Hannah, they all three got back in the car and left her body in the vineyard's edge. It was a bright morning in South Africa. The parents of Hannah and Cheslin had no idea what their kids had gone through that terrible night. Now, there was a couple had awoken with a beautiful spring weekend ahead. They did own a tiny home that was located on the outskirts of Cry Fontaine. As they got up, 
they did hear a sound of the morning birds chirping and hurrying at the farm animals from a distance. They also heard some groaning, and that got their attention. As they went closer to the window, they heard more groaning. Then it became screams of help. They had seen a young man. He had stumbled and dazed. He was covered with blood all over. It was Cheslin. He had survived the brutal attack that the two men had did on him that night. He miraculously made it through the beating and is alive. Even though he had been beaten with bricks, his mind stayed on tact of what happened and who did this to him. His first thought was Hannah. What happened to her? He tried to locate her, but he couldn't. She was nowhere to be found. Had stumbled and walked weary down the road to seek help by the nearby home. As they came up, the couple were hesitant and scared. At first sight, they thought he was a gang thug and told him to leave. And he told them over and over to call the police because he needed help. After hearing him out, they knew this was more than what they realized it to be. So they had called the police for him, and the police had came within minutes. He told them that they needed to find and help his friend Hannah, that they had been kidnapped. He described the three men that attacked and robbed him, the car that they were in, and where they had gone that night. He also told them everything that he could remember to help them get the men to find Hannah. While he had been unconscious, little did he know, unfortunately, It had been too late for Hannah. She was found two hours earlier when he was unconscious. She was confirmed dead. While the family and friends of Hannah and Cheslin were dealing with the grief of what happened to both of them, the police did not stop. They went out canvassing and looking for the assailants. They knew the car they were in and what color it was. They did keep an eye out for it while searching everywhere. It was not long before they did locate it throughout the morning because they were not done with the crime spree. The robbers, right after the assault on Cheslin and the rape and the murder of Hannah, they were around Cry Fontaine. They were seen chasing a woman down on her way to work. They had robbed her of her purse and her cell phone. Then later, they attacked another woman around 1 p.m., but this time they kidnapped her. CCTV had captured the car driving near a gas station. It shows it pulling up. You can see the woman in the back of the car with even Van Neerkirk. He was with her. Then you can see Whitboy get out of the car and go into the store, and he's heading straight toward the ATM to draw out money that they wanted to withdraw $200. Their victim was unhurt, and she was dropped off safely on a rural road. Then they went to drop off even at his home. They had given him his share of the money. Then the two men went to pawn the car to random strangers. Unaware to them, the police had been alerted to their whereabouts the whole morning. Now the police were closing in on them as they were driving around. They were not realizing they were going to be caught. It was an undercover police car that had seen a car pass by. Then the second police car had joined the pursuit. The two men had tried to outrun them. They did not want to be caught. They had driven into a nearby private farm. CCTV shows them pulling into the private farm and innocent bystanders looking on to see what's happening. You can see the detective running on foot to catch them. The men had come up on a blue gate. They could not go any further. So they abandoned the car. The two men had taken off and ran with their sprints and jumped over the river below. In the end, they could not escape from the officers. They were trapped. Upon their arrest, Geraldo and Whitboy started telling them who their friends were and who they were with them that night. They told them where they could find them and their names. The next day, they got arrested as well. Hannah's parents were inconsolable, losing their daughter in such a way that her mom could not handle it. They made a foundation in honor of their daughter, Hannah Cornelius. Now this foundation helps the at-risk by providing education, counseling, and guidance. 
Hannah was not their only murder victim of this outrageous act they did that night. There was soon to be another victim of theirs. One year after Hannah's death in 2018, Hannah's mother was found floating in South Africa Ocean. Anna's death was ruled a fatal accident, while William claimed he did not believe his wife intended to kill herself. He added that she lacked the physical or mental strength to deal with the horrifying slaughter of their daughter. The case against the four men that murdered Hannah that night, an attempted murder of Jaislin, terrorized many people that night and the following day. The case was a strong one, and in May 2018, the proceedings would finally get underway. The detectives had testimonies from them, confessions. Also, the police had CCTV footage, forensics evidence, and the primary person was Cheslin, who took the stand and told them what happened to him and Hannah. As he was testifying, he had looked every one of them in the eye. The prosecutors even brought in the rock that killed Hannah, brought into the court, still having her blood stain on it. With the multiple blunt force trauma to the skull, unfortunately, Cheslin had lost hearing in one ear. He wanted to honor his dear friend Hannah. His testimony was tearful and very emotional. His family had been there the full support. His mother had been waiting for him. When he got off the stand, he was beside himself with the grief and what he had to tell the courts. There were only two confessions to what had happened that night, they, but they all pleaded not guilty to the crimes they had committed. Now, throughout the court proceedings, you can see that they had no remorse whatsoever what they'd done. Instead, you can see them smiling and laughing the whole time. Vernon, Whitboy, and Geraldo Parsons, and even Van Nierkook, were sentenced to life in prison, and Nashville Julius, who was the one that had left at the beginning of the rampage, was sentenced to 22 years for aid, robbery, and kidnapping. The death of Hannah was senseless and ruthless. What these men did was horrific, no compassion for one another person as a result of a gruesome death of Hannah and the loss of her mother, who could not stand knowing what happened to her daughter and what had went through, and she could not help her. The disregard for anyone else but only cared for themselves and the permanent physical damage Cheslin will be forever a reminder of what happened to him and his dear friend Hannah, who will always be in his heart. The three men that had said that they went out on the streets that night to, quote, see what they could get. Let's hope that they will never get out of prison. This story of Hannah is one of many that happen to innocents taken too soon. Loved ones who are distraught and heartbroken, even though that they're not together any longer, the impact that Hannah had made on her ex was distraught in the loss of his high school sweetheart. He said the minute that he laid eyes on her, he thought, this will be my wife. These moving words by Hannah Cornelius's ex-boyfriend were spoken at her funeral. Always remember the victims in all this. Remember Hannah, while she was here on earth, the short time that she was here. And also remember Cheslin. Don't forget what he's doing now to help those who are in need like they were. Her caring volunteer work, studying with her bright smile, love of life, her selfishness, even the thought of others. On that night, she was murdered by giving her best friend a lift home because she did not want him to get hurt. Hannah was a gift to all who knew her, then had been taken away. Her brother, who has severe autism, still to this day does not know what happened to Hannah, and he keeps asking, when is his sister coming home? 
Cheslin did not continue his studies after what had happened to him. He needed to take a break. Now he's been enrolled and switched over to law. He wants to make a difference. He wants to make an effort to aid those like him and Hannah. To him, her legacy will live on in him. There is currently a fundraiser to help Cheslin with his studies. There will be a link down in the description down below for those of you who would like to help him in any way. This case has been a hard one for me. All the loss and devastation of these four men had caused just in one night. Hannah's death has left a hole in her family and all her friends.